So welcome Norman Sherman um, to what well, is a great honor for the Keen on Yoga podcast to have you here today. Uh, Norman was really the, one of the forerunners, I think, with Elizabeth D. McAllis's book on it, um, for modern yoga scholarship. And he published a book, very influential book called uh, The Traditions of the Mysore Palace. Is that is that right? The Yoga Tradition of the Mysore yoga, Palace. The Yoga Traditions of the Mysore Palace. Um, and, and that was, I think, was it 97? I've got that date in my mind. It was something. I think 96. Yeah, yeah. That, but bloody early, whatever. And, uh, and before anyone else was really talking, it, but previous to that, it was translations of Sanskrit texts. And there was no modern scholarship, and Norman really kicked that off. So, uh, you know, we're really honored to have Norman here today. And um, just give me a basic um, overview, Norman, as you were mentioning before we started, of what inspired you in the first place just to. Uh, to get involved in, in you know, in, in yoga scholarship, as it were. You really are happy to pioneer in the field. Well, I didn't really start with the yoga scholarship. Um, uh, as I was saying, it was Sanskrit that started it off. And I was walking down the, the street in Odengarten one day and heard the word Sanskrit. And somehow I knew that I was going to study Sanskrit. And I didn't even know it was an Indian language. So, um, so, uh, I did start and I had a terrible time in Sweden studying because um, people study academically and I, I like to be able to speak. And um, uh, at the same time that I started studying Sanskrit, I started working with a, a book by a gauche in Sweden, trying to learn yoga from a book. I, I, I was always interested in yoga because I didn't like team sports, like um, those kind of, uh, things and yoga was a possibility of doing yeah. things and then actually a, a French fellow came to Stockholm and he taught 10 lessons in yoga and he had been in a car accident and uh, was had been damaged badly and um, he managed to he had a Chinese physiotherapist who noticed that some of the things he would he was doing were like yoga and got him got him uh doing yoga and he ended up being able to clear his whole body except for cut tendons so uh, that was that was my start and as far as the yoga tradition of the Mysore palace the question that came up there was where do all these asanas come from because they aren't in the original texts and that was my prime motivating motivating factor and then i found the the sri tatvaniti text yeah. And the Oriental Institute in Mysore wouldn't let me wouldn't let me photograph it or use it. They had a they had a copy. There was there was three hand done copies made of it. But His Highness allowed me to photograph the the Shitatvaniti in the palace. So uh, that's how I managed to get a hold of that text and we'll work on that text, which was then, of course, that was the only source of asanas at the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, it's very, people probably don't know that how, how unique it was that Norman got to photograph that text, because subsequently everyone, Jason Birch and Jim Mallison and other people, have, you know, the modern scholars that we might know, have been using these, uh, these photographs of yours with your permission, I believe, um, because no one can else can get to see it now. I just want to back up a second, because I mean, I, how did you get, what were you doing in Sweden? Um, and were you already studying yoga at the time you said you mentioned sanskrit your canadian as a background you know in terms of your you know, your your upbringing you're canadian so and what, what was happening up to that point that got you in, into yoga and what other scholarship had you done previously um i started in um uh, i took a, a ba at the um, university of british columbia and i entered into a field kand in stockholm's university and um uh that was an interesting that was an interesting that's been an interesting thing for me because for example in studies like literature in north america they would say um uh re read that book and tell me what it's about and don't tell me what the critics are saying but in sweden you have a compendium you may read a paragraph of the work and you have a compendium telling you everything about the author his mother his father his his psychological problems and 
and what the interpretations are. And then, of course, going to going to India, I, I, I spent almost 25 years in India and I was working with uh, mostly with traditional pundits and I was ostracized in the university for working with with pundits um, because that wasn't modern learning. But th that was um, um, just a period of, uh, of a different kind of learning altogether. And there, instead of knowledge being sort of an accumulation of information in some kind of way, knowledge is worked as transformative. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't work, it just doesn't work in the same way. Like if you say you know something, you'll get tested on it. So you, we were, you were living in India for 25 years or back and forth. As, I don't know exactly your background. Were you an academic in, in, in Stockholm or, uh, you know, and what, and what were you studying? What were you translating before this, uh, this seminal book that, that we all know? I began studying um, uh, world literature and Scandinavian literature. Right. And uh, that included Icelandic, Danish and, uh, and Norwegian literature as well. And uh, then I switched to Sanskrit and religious studies. And then in, in India, I was at the Center of Advanced Studies in Sanskrit for four, actually six years doing a PhD. And then I went and studied with, I went to Mysore and I studied with pundits for another 20 years. And the kind of, studying that I used to do, I'd spend about two hours in the morning working with somebody individually. And then uh, I'd have to try and remember that in the afternoon and then spend another hour in the evening with a teacher. I wouldn't talk past six o'clock at night because it is too difficult to remember things if you talk too much. And um, uh, so I studied Shastras there where it got to the point where anything that I wanted to study it was like a five-year job of two hours a day. And finally, you have, to, you have to put a limit on what you can study. And even, even after all of that study, I, I, actually, I actually took a pundit degree in the Patashala. And even after all that study, you still feel like you're a charlatan. <laughs> were you publishing these works? I mean, is there, is there, or were you just learning for your, for your own sake? I was just learning for my own sake, really. I never thought of publishing. Right. In fact, even the yoga tradition of the Mysore Palace was ready five years before it got published. I couldn't find a publisher. Nobody wanted it. They wanted a how-to book on yoga. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, I mean, I didn't realize how committed you were to, to yoga. Is that, is that something that you found in your upbringing? I mean, was there, were there roots in it? in your childhood or you know what was the what was the thing that motivated you to to spend all these years studying like this well really i feel i felt that yoga and sanskrit were about the same thing about concentration right so they were they work together right fair enough yeah exactly and be your practicing posture yoga as well weren't you I mean, yeah, I was doing postural yoga. I was working with, a, I'd got to the point where I was working with advanced asanas with a Yengar. And, and even finding him, I didn't know, I, I had found his book in Sweden uh, some time before. And then I went to Pune and I was at the university and I found out that he was teaching. So I went over to his place and asked him if he, if he would teach me. Really? When was that? I didn't, I didn't know that. That was in 1970, about 1970 or something. Oh, right, okay, so early on, that must have been incredible. Well, there were no foreigners. There were very few foreigners that came to him at that time. Yeah, yeah. And I got put in with, an, in fact, it was, it was um, always a problem with uh, when new foreigners came, uh, the first thing would be a uh, breaking down, you know, you, oh, you, 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 you you, you, you think that you're going to uh, get enlightened in five minutes or something like that, and then there would be a dressing down. <laughs> I mean, I, one problem was probably that you wasn't there, that you, you spoke the languages, probably. I imagine you could, uh, by that time, 
be quite communicative with with uh, BKSC Anglo and Marathi or such? Oh, I never studied. I studied Marathi just very slightly, but Iyengar actually speaks Kannada. Oh, does he? Uh, and, and he's in Iyengar. The Iyengars in Karnataka speak Tamil. Oh. And did you manage to and speak I, to learn that? Yeah, no, I, I I didn't speak to him at all in Canada at that time. I didn't I didn't know enough Canada to be able to talk to him. That came much later. What what do you think of um BK? I wasn't planning to quiz you on BKC Yenga, but you know what what did you think of your teaching with BKC in your time with him? Well, at the time um, at the time. Uh, uh, there, I mean, he was. It was a very small class, so he was teaching. Like I, I never, I quit going to him when he got his new, new um, uh, shala built by CS. But um, what I find is, I, I've had to teach. For example, at the University of Calgary, I was asked to teach a, a five lecture course on Tibetan art, and it was in one of these lecture theaters where they, where they scoop down and there and I realized as soon as I walked into there you're not teaching any longer you're performing <laughs> and what I sort of feel like with the with the um, uh, even with yoga and uh, and all of these things is yoga is really an individual it was Yogendra who started yoga classes and yoga classes are sort of like a like a, a slightly less damaging issue of zoom where where you watch people but you don't touch them so whatever they do they do within the range of their own postural preferences and uh, unless you have that one-on-one -on -one teaching it just doesn't uh, it doesn't really work and I, I, I've been very fortunate because I've had one-on-one -on -one teaching in Sanskrit over a period of 20, 25 years and, and also one-on-one -on -one teaching on yoga. So you didn't keep that relate because I think a Yenga, I think you mentioned in the um in, in subsequent editions of the of the book that a Yenga wasn't immediately happy with with uh, what you were putting forth in the book. Is that, is that right? Oh, no, nobody was happy. No, Patabi, no one was happy. No, <laughs> right there. For Tabby Drake, you say, yes, it is a bad book. <laughs> and and Iyengar said I had insulted his family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, but it kind of blew, blew the light on, it kind of blew the light on the guru worship and Westerners have contributed to that. Actually, it's interesting because Abhinava Gupta says, that it, when you're trying to pursue knowledge, it's guru ta shastra ta swataha. The, the knowledge comes from the guru. You have to back that up with knowledge, with knowledge from the shastras. And ultimately, you have to do it on your own. And each one of these are successively more important. So did you did you meet Patabi Joyce as well? Uh, actually, I met him once. Darby took me over once to uh, to uh, Mount, Mount Darby. Uh, yeah, oh, I didn't know you knew Mark. Actually, just because you were there at the same time, I suppose, right? We were. He was living at the in, in a place just across the street from from or across the fence from me, actually. Really, the Darby is my teacher, my my Aston teacher. That's a, that's a nice coincidence. Um, well, what I suppose the obvious question that springs to mind is, what motivated you to pursue and you know and write the book in the first place? Well, uh, the, the big thing was, uh, was where do all the asanas come from? As far as I was concerned, yoga was asanas. That was, that was it. And it was skill in asanas, which made, made the big difference. So I wanted to find out what the source of this was. And yeah. it, it's taken me, it, it, it really, I mean, that book was only the beginning, the, the, the beginning of it. Like later on, I've gone into... I've gone into other texts uh, which all deal with yoga, as, as, as I sent you the book of uh, Yoga yeah. Sutta Chintamani, and um, to try and find out uh, exactly the whole tradition because the, the asanas are an abbreviation blip in there. Mm. What do you mean by that? 
Can you explain further? Well, asanas, asanas can be used as a spiritual discipline, uh, can work as a spiritual discipline if you use it in a certain way, but that's not the prim primary means of what we're talking about. And, and that's also valid. Bhartrahari, third century or fifth century, said that when you're pursuing spiritual knowledges, they always start with an illusion or delusion. And if you're lucky, you may, you, you may come to some idea that is actual or real. So going back to the Sri uh, Tatra Nidhi, um, this is a, you know, a unique book you got. You know, you, you managed to get your hands on in the end. I mean, um, um, were you surprised with what you found there? And were you surprised that you couldn't find the Yoga Karunta anywhere in sight? Well, uh, uh, for a long time, I thought the Yoga Karunta didn't exist. And uh, actually, it's interesting because I, because, uh, I don't know that you've read the recent article of Jason Birch on Hatha, Hatha Abhyasa Paddhati. I think I have, yeah, yeah. But um, the, I had that in my hands too, and I only photographed part of it. And that, that was probably the source of the Sri, Sri Tattva Nidhi. Huh. Right, right. And, and for people that don't know, what exactly is this text? I mean, it's uh, how, many, how many yoga postures are detailed in it? Well, there's 120, 121 asanas or, or more. I'm not quite sure the, the exact number. But the Hatha Abhyasa Paddhati was used to compile the Sri Tattva Nidhi, it looks like. Right. And you saw that text as well? Yeah, I, I photographed that text. I gave the, the photographs to Jason Birch, but I only took something like 30 photographs because I was the Sri Tattva Nidhi were, the asanas were better. Actually, the asanas in the Sri Tattva Nidhi are absolutely beautiful. They're beautiful line drawings done, and they didn't come out that way in the yoga tradition of the Mysore Palace because of his inability to uh, to make excellent page pictures mm, mm. it's not bad you get you get some idea at, at least um, you, you get an idea but that's all you get you don't get you don't get to see the fine artwork we so when you were looking when you were looking there originally you were looking for the source of uh, Krishnamacharya's yoga, do you, did you do you feel that the uh, Sri Tatra Nidhi um, expresses is is explicitly that source, or do you think there's further interpolations of Krishnamacharya uh, using that text at, in part and other things as well? I, I think what the Sri Tatra Nidhi did, it gave, gave an idea of what could be done, and then you had to, but the Sri Tatra Nidhi was not a the not a uh, complete text in itself. It was an illustration. So sometimes the write-up doesn't compare with the pictures, or the pictures don't compare with the particular verse. It was done by the palace ateliers. Yeah. So they had to kind of uh, uh, swing it to make it look good. And I mean, we 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 surprised at, at what you found there, or we or were you expecting something of that like? I mean, what led you what led you to find it in the first place? How did you come upon it? Well, actually, somebody directed me to it in the Oriental Institute, and they had a they had a copy, they had a copy, but their copy wasn't a finished copy of the Sri Tatvaniti. It wasn't colored in. It's just in in line drawings. Uh, I think there is some shading in there in black and white, but it was from a text that they happened to find in the in a, 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 a pundit's house, and he passed it on to there. It was passed on to the Oriental Institute when he died. And um, there were two copies in the palace. One was the Queen's copy and the other one, and one of them disappeared. One of the, one of the copies disappeared but I, there, there was still one copy kept in the Saraswati Bandar library in the palace. And Sri Kantadatta allowed me to see. Did you manage to see, did you manage to find any, I mean, you mentioned the Yoga Karunta as extant. I mean, did you manage to find any traces of anything, you know, more, more clearly uh, delineating the Ashtanga sequences? Not really. Um, uh, 
the Ashtanga sequence is kind of uh, um, uh, the ideas are there in the Sri Tattva Nidhi, but they aren't explicitly brought out. Mm, like they're thinking mm-hmm. of that more as uh, more as a sort of text on the individual asanas rather than rather than the 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 movement and uh, those kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you were doing this study and you were there, you must have been talking to people. I mean, did did you did you learn more about the background of Krishna Charya? I mean, because you know it's always mentioned he goes off to Tibet for all these years and he finds the Yoga Kunta there, but always given the Yoga Kunta by his teacher there. I mean, did you you know what what surprised you about this, your your time studying in the Mysore Palace? Well, what surprised me about what I found in the Mysore Palace? Yeah, yeah, or your time talking to, I mean, you must have talked to you know, librarians and different people there. Right? Yeah, actually, it's, it's, it's the situation of yoga at that time was there was no interest in yoga. There was no popular interest in yoga. And amongst the pundits and the, the scholars, there was no real interest in yoga. The idea was that Vedanta was really the outcome of was the outcome of yoga, and Vedanta was looked upon as being the the um, purpose of purpose of yoga, which no longer had a validity. And part of the thing was it was a dualistic a dualistic philosophy, and the dualism didn't hold up philosophically. There was you couldn't make the connection between Purusha and Prakriti satisfactorily philosophically so it wasn't looked on uh, the pop the popular popularization of yoga as the popularization of sanskrit really has come from western interest hmm. mm, mm, mm. i mean yeah that is it's hard to fathom at that time it really wasn't there really wasn't anyone else doing modern scholarship on the origins they you know just kind of translating texts old texts right so you were really out on the limit at that point and you got some as we mentioned you you got you know quite a lot of heavy uh, criticism for it didn't you i mean um well, were, we, were you were we surprised well no i knew it was going to be a bombshell right but uh, but uh, i got physical threats people would say well i i'm going to write a book on that and i'm tell the truth and uh, but I think my I think I was covered quite well that that it was very hard evidence to argue against. What do you think upset people about the book? If if people haven't read you know the book or seen this book, I mean, what what was it that was particularly um, kind of like a kind of shattering or kind of you know uh, about this book? Let's say I'm not really sure. Um, in total, but um, yeah. uh, I've been told I've insulted the te- the Ashtanga teachers, that it was an insult to them. And um, uh, I, I think one of the one of the big problems was is this Western idea, Western ideas of the guru, like they want to put this divine thing on the guru that this is this is a divine knowledge, and the Ashtangis felt that they were getting the correct knowledge from the guru from 3000 years ago and that book kind of blew that up blew that away 